pet. Objectification. Sex pod. Angel. Babe. Honey. Princess. Baby girl. Penguin. Corky. Glowworm. From the obvious and well used to the corruptions and bastardization of your first name through to the downright bizarre, pet names are a standard feature of relationships. Parents may have a nickname or pet name for their child. We use nicknames for our friends. But most often they are used in the context of an intimate relationship. Their use is to denote endearment and to highlight something special and unique. Although using babe is hardly going to any win any awards for originality, is it? And it does this between that person and their significant other. When used in the context of a non-narcissistic relationship, they are relatively harmless, perhaps hinting at something which teases and might be mildly embarrassing. For example, calling somebody glowworm because they go red and become embarrassed easily. But generally, they are used as a fond and kind epitaph. The situation, however, becomes corrupted and is used entirely different in our hands. We use pet names for our primary sources, but our motives for doing so are not about being genuinely endearing, but for a host of more nefarious reasons. Although all narcissists are likely to use pet names, they're more prevalent among lesser and lower mid-range. Furthermore, these pet names are used more extensively for the primary source, but they will also be used for secondary sources, both intimate and non-intimate. The utilisation of these pet names is for the following reasons. 1. It is done to appear endearing to you, so that you think that you are actually special to us, that you merit being given a pet name, therefore you are led to think that we naturally care and love you, since we have taken this little special step. And this is done because it is a standard step in many intimate relationships, and all we are actually doing is mimicking what we have seen for the purposes of controlling you by making you think that the relationship between you and us is wonderful, special and marvellous. Number two. Possession. The narcissistic mindset is such that you are our possession. By giving you a label in this manner, we are branding you and stamping on you that you belong to us. It enables us to exert control over you. Indeed, this branding is often done in the context of getting you to have a tattoo of our name on you or the pet name that we have given you to be placed on you. And, in certain instances, is taken so far as to actually have names or initials branded upon an individual See, for example, Keith Ranieri's cult. 3. Objectification We dehumanise you because we actually see you as objects. Lesser and mid-range narcissists do this in their unconscious. Greater and ultra recognise that we just see you as possessions that have been objectified that we utilise for our purposes. Giving you a pet name reinforces the objectification that you are subjected to. We may well call you Angel, but from our perspective you're just an angel, one of hundreds, no thousands that are out there. In the way that those who find themselves in a perilous situation might use their name with an aggressor or kidnapper, in order to humanise themselves, to protect themselves, to try and create a connection with their kidnapper. We utilise pet names to dehumanise you. It is our position 
that you are an object to us. And therefore, as part of this dehumanization and objectification, you become easier to control and therefore abuse. Four, we use the same pet names for many of our appliances. There will, of course, be differences when, for example, the pet name is a play on your actual name. So if you're called Rebecca, we might call you Becky Pops. But if it is a pet name which has nothing to do with your actual name or and is nothing to do with an actual distinct attribute of yours, then you should be aware that the name that you have been given is neither unique, novel or special. Plenty of other people before you will have been called by the same name. Understand also that your replacements will receive this pet name as well. 5. By using a pet name and keeping the same for all of our relevant sources, both primary and secondary, we minimise the risk of calling you accidentally by the wrong name and bringing about questioning and a challenge to our control. Thus, if we call you sugar bumps and we are having an affair, the other person will also be called sugar bumps. If you are ever granted access to the narcissist's phone, do not be surprised to see Sugar Bumps 1 and Sugar Bumps 2 in the directory. 6. As with many things narcissist, what we grant we then take away in order to upset and assert control over you. Thus, if we always refer to you during a seduction as hot stuff, you can expect that come devaluation, we no longer call you hot stuff and call you by your actual name, or indeed, we might corrupt your pet name, calling you Iceberg or Cold Stuff instead. This is devaluing behaviour which is done to make you react and for the purposes of asserting control over you by being f hurt as a consequence of this change in the supposedly affectionate pet name. 7. In some instances, the pet name may actually seem like a compliment to you. But instead, it has a hidden meaning, which is known to us. And whilst you smile when you hear this name being used, we are actually laughing at you on the inside because you don't realise you are being insulted. Others may well be in on this inside joke as well. So, for example, we might joke and refer to you as the boss. And we say this in front of you in our coterie. And we would say, thanks for asking, I'll have to run it by the boss. You hear this and you smile at this apparently affectionate deference to your authority. Oblivious to the fact that my coterie and I know that the name actually means best of seven sluts. Being a reference to how we regard you sexually and of course devaluing behaviour. 8. In some instances we forget who you actually are because of the fact that we regard you as an object. But if we call all objects munchkin, then we can fall back on that and refer to you by this name without appearing stupid for forgetting what you are called and inviting a threat by way of a challenge to our control. 9. We may invent new and different pet names, which are insulting, disrespectful and unpleasant when we embark on our devaluation of you. We may call you the rash because you keep appearing everywhere when we do not want to see you. We may call you the pirate because you have small breasts, i.e. a sunken chest. We may label you as the thorn because you are a pain in our side. Or we may just go for it. As my regular listeners and readers will know from my treatment of Leslie. Number 10. We will also insist that you use a pet name for us, but then we choose it. Of course, nobody normal or empathic chooses their own nickname and then tells them to use it. This is evidence of our grandiosity and the need to assert control. Nicknames ordinarily evolve from characteristics witnessed by those around the recipient of the name. The fact that we appear and tell you to call us golden balls is evidence of our sense of entitlement need to assert control and grandiosity. The use of a pet name by our kind is never to be regarded as pleasant and complimentary. It is a device for control. 
It is a device for demeaning you and upsetting you. In the same way that one keeps a pet animal, that is how you are regarded, as we keep you in one of our gilded and then blackened cages.'